After the soul-crushing failures of Exozombies and Infinite Warfare, I was 100% convinced that no non-Treyarch studio could do zombies properly, and that this game was going to be terrible. Was I right? Well, let's get into it, shall we? I really like World War II zombies. I honestly didn't expect to be saying this, but I love the atmosphere, I love the new additions to the zombies formula, I love the story, I love the characters. Well, two of them are pretty good. Like I said at the top of the video, I was 100% convinced that only Treyarch could do zombies properly, and I'm more than happy to admit that I was wrong. Sledgehammer seems to have taken the criticism of exo-zombies and the newer entries to heart, and created something that feels like a return to zombies' as roots, but something new at the same time. The more recent maps were too hard for newer players to get into? Well, here's an optional notebook guide that shows you your objectives and your items of importance. The games have strayed too far from their horror roots? Well, here's a map filled with dark hallways and genuinely disturbing creatures. The new games don't feel grounded anymore? Well, you get the idea. But we're not here to mindlessly foam at the mouth like, Oh my god, this game is so good. Or, Oh my god, this game is literally worse than actual World War II. We're here to instead take a more critical look at everything the package has to offer. Well, I've rambled enough, let's dive right into World War II Zombies. Like with the Infinite Warfare review, I feel it'd be best to start with the elements that carry through the entire game, and then move on to the maps themselves. Starting with the gameplay and the things I like about it. World War II, in true Sledgehammer format, wasn't fit with simply applying a new coat of paint and calling it a day like some other zombies experiences that shall remain nameless because god forbid I criticize something you like. Instead, they take what worked about the best entries and build upon it by adding completely new gameplay mechanics. And it actually works out this time. Starting with the class loadouts. Much like Extinction, the pre-game loadouts allow you to further tailor the game to your playstyle beyond just picking from the map's available perks. Say for instance that you like to serve as a cautious medic of your party. Then you can pick certain abilities to accentuate that playstyle such as camouflage and preventative medicine. Or let's say you prefer a more brutish, run and gun approach to zombies. There's mods and specials for you too like Shell Shock and Free Fire. You can also customize and change the starting weapon before each match. You start out with only a pistol, but eventually, through leveling your character up, you can take a double barrel shotgun or even a semi-automatic rifle in place of it. But with this loadout system comes one thing I don't like, the consumables. They're so rarely obtained because of the terrible earn rate for zombie crates, and they barely even affect gameplay. The system isn't necessarily a step down from the admitted improvement Infinity Ward made with their Fate and Fortune cards, but rather, it just feels like an afterthought that only exists because A, well the other guys did it, so we kinda have to, and B, because microtransactions. Another thing I actually really like is the armor and self-revive system. In every zombie's experience since Black Ops 2, three of your four perk slots were pretty much spoken for every game. You need Quick Revive if you want to keep your game going, you need Juggernaug to deal with the faster zombies, and in some games' cases, unforgivably terrible zombie collision. And of course, Double Tap makes your weapons more powerful, so of course you need it. So now you only have one free perk slot. Or in IW's case, you have two. World War II does away with that. Kind of. Double Tap is still mandatory, but due to the presence of armor and self-revive, provided you have some remaining, it's the only perk that's pretty much essential, giving you more potential variety in your perk loadouts. And adding on to that is the fact that Mule Kick and PhD are now mods, so that's even more freedom for you. And while we're talking about perks, it's a relatively minor thing, or maybe it's not. Depends on your point of view. But I hate the perk buying animation in this game. Sure, it looks cool and makes sense canonically, but let's ignore canon for just a second and look at it from a gameplay stance. You know something's bad when I'm saying, ignore the story implications. It's very difficult to buy perks mid-round and solo since you're immobilized for two seconds and unable to fight back for another three. Bad kid, bad kid, there's a bad kid right there. If I do say so myself, I say so. That's what I'm not talking about right there, right there, right there. Ooh, bad shit. Oh, one last thing I forgot to mention. The zombie collision is fucking fantastic. You never get caught on stray zombies like in World of War, and with the right timing, you're able to easily maneuver yourself out of tight situations. Well, of course the zombie collision is good, Rizzo. It's been good since World of War. No developer could possibly fuck up that badly. Right? Okay, back on track. The Notebook Hint System The Notebook is a new feature to Call of Duty Zombies that attempts to bridge the gap between the hardcore-only nature of Black Ops 3's more difficult maps and the more casual nature of Black Ops 1 and Infinite Warfare. When active, it'll show you your current objective and outline certain important items essential to completing said objective. 
However, this will only get you so far. The notebook only assists you through the casual path, which consists of getting the power on, building the base Tesla gun, and completing the casual version of the map's main quest. But fear not, hardcore audience. There's still plenty of hidden little Easter eggs sprinkled through the map, and there's an extended ending just for you. The notebook can also be used to give you insight on certain items and weapons around the map, which, speaking of little things, the quality of life things. These are just the little details that don't necessarily change the game dramatically, but instead just make the experience feel better overall. I'm gonna list these off real quick. Power-ups spawn behind zombies so you don't accidentally pick them up during a round transition. The shotgun point system returns some exo zombies, so you earn points for every pellet hit instead of on a per shot basis. Points can be instantly shared at any time with the press of a button, instead of having to go to a certain spot on the map or using the hacker for 18 years. Traps don't deal enormous amounts of damage to the player instantly, so they're more forgiving of slip ups and, thank god, griefing opportunities are cut down on. You're given 20 seconds between rounds, and there's a countdown telling you how much time is left. The game has a text pop-up telling you when the Panzer Mortar is stunned, and when he's not, so you don't have to guess every time. Max ammo's refill your clip when grabbed. Important quotes now have subtitles, so you'll never miss anything. Most quest-related quotes have multiple takes, so that if you're in a tight situation, your character will shout it instead of calmly saying it like in previous entries. You can select your character in the pregame lobby, which is something I've wanted for years. I always loved playing specifically as Richtofen in Black Ops 3, but some days the game just wouldn't let me have him. But now with this, I can play as my favorite character every game if I want to. It's always Marie. And finally, the special prompt stays up on screen until used. This may annoy some players, but I personally really love this because I'm admittedly kind of a klutz and would always forget that I even had my special weapons in Black Ops 3. With this, I never forget. Now that we're through what I liked about the gameplay, let's get into the story. There, I put gameplay before story. Are you happy, comment? The story of World War II Zombies reminds me much of Extinction in that it's simple, yet expansive, easy to follow, yet rewards a more inquisitive viewer. The real story begins with Dr. Marie Fisher's journal entries. Wait, journal entries? I didn't see those in-game. Well, that's because they're not. The journal entries were part of the minuscule marketing for zombies this year, and as such, you have to go online to view them. The journals provide some backstory on Marie's time in the OSS, her contentious relationship with her brother Klaus, their father's death, his defection from the Nazi party, and ultimately, her assembly of a team that can help her get back home in time to rescue him. None of this is mandatory reading, as the prologue does its job of introducing us to the team and world, but it does help flesh out the story and the Fisher family. The point I'm trying to make is, a casual viewer will still be able to understand what's going on, and if that grabs them, then they can go look up the extra stuff online instead of having to read, um, this mess. Look, I love Treyarch's new zombie story. I think it's fantastic, and there's nothing really like it. But even I have to admit, it's extremely alienating to casual viewers. The journals lead us directly into the prologue, where our heroes, and this one guy that has four lines of dialogue, are getting debriefed on their mission to Middleburg. Their mission is to recover the ancient relic Straub and Cobain experimenting with, while Marie's is primarily to rescue her brother. At this point, we get a brief glimpse at a giant monster that flips our train car and separates Marie from the rest of the squad, setting our main story in motion. One last thing I'd like to mention before we get into the characters is that this game's story makes an attempt to canonize or rationalize everything in some way. Points, wall buys, doors, etc. now offer an in-universe explanation. Points are now jolts and are stored in the battery on your person. Every time a zombie is killed, their energy is absorbed into the battery, which can be used to unlock weapon caches, generate power for the mystery box, and open doors fitted with special locks. I don't pretend to understand the science. Now we move on to the characters. World War II Zombies' on-disc experiences feature an all-star cast of Doctor Who's David Tennant, Daredevil's Elodie Young, Pulp Fiction's Ving Rhames, Baron Frankenstein himself, Udo Kier, and Catherine Winnick. What was she in? Okay, a bunch of stuff I haven't seen. Let's start things off with the good. This applies to all characters, but they're much more serious this time around and rarely crack jokes. I know some people prefer the jokier characters found in Treyarch's early entries, and while I enjoy them too, I understand that Sledgehammer were going for something completely different here. Did that sound condescending to the people who like the jokier characters? Maybe, but I really didn't mean for it to. My bad. Sledgehammer said that they wanted to go for something a bit more grounded and less fantastical with Nazi zombies. So naturally, in a real-world zombie scenario, god forbid, there might be one goofball cracking a joke or two, the role which Drosten fills. But everyone else will be much more focused on survival than, as Takio would put it, No time for clever quips. We have a war to win. Whether you like this or not comes down to personal preference. But after the absolute train wrecks that were the Victus crew in Black Ops 2 and every character in Infinite Warfare Zombies, except for God himself, of course. I'm totally cool with something a bit more grounded. Let's start out with our main character, Marie Fisher. 
Much like Black Ops 3's Richtofen or Mob of the Dead's Arlington, Marie is clearly the focal character of our group and as a result, is easily the most developed. We understand why she's doing what she's doing, we get a sense of her moral code through the journal entries and her fights with Klaus, we get the tenacity for which she fights for him through quotes I've never heard in game, but instead heard through extracting them, and after failing to save him from the Panzer Mortar, we see that she's the one with the most humanity. As for Klaus, we understand why he decided to side with the Nazi party 10 years ago. He was an idealist, blinded by his patriotism and his need to have a purpose in life. But as the Nazis' occupation of Middleburg drew on, and Straub's creations became more and more twisted, he called out to Marie for help and set in motion a plan to help her get to him and stop Straub once and for all. He's the one who hid the parts for the Tesla guns, started the outbreak, and hid the symbols and the paintings needed to activate the voice of God. These revelations give us a clear understanding of his moral compass, as well as finally giving us an in-universe explanation as to why all these cool and powerful things are just conveniently laying around the map. Marie and Klaus are just all-around solid characters, but talking about the good of these characters does lead me into two problems I have. Number one, the other three characters, Drosten Hind, Olivia Durant, and Jefferson Potts. My name is Jeff. While they're serviceable, have their own quirks, and are entertaining in their own right, it's clear that the focus was on the Fisher family, and as a result, everyone else feels a bit underdeveloped. They all have their moments of humanity, but they're mainly just them comforting Murray along the journey. And some of the stuff we know about them isn't even communicated to us in-game. Like, I know that Olivia's parents were taken by the Nazis, and that's why she does what she does. But that's only because Elodie Young si Elodie? I might be pronouncing that right. Said it herself during the Zombies Comic Con panel. And yes, yeah, she was uh, very keen on joining the team because her dad um, got captured by the Nazis. And she's very passionate about art and, um, and so, yeah, so. And number two, Elodie Young's accent in the intro. I have no idea what she's trying to do here. The Nazis have taken so much from us all. This art belongs to the people. Okay, but seriously, this little goofy aside does bring up a valid point. The deliveries are, for the most part, solid, but there are a few standouts where you just wish they had tried the line one more time. For example, I'm sorry, Marie. We'll find them. I promise. However, these problems I have are things that could easily be corrected in the future, just like Exozombies and Black Ops 3. In Exozombies, the characters were all okay-ish, and you got them as people. Kind of. But as the season went on, they were further developed and the actors got more comfortable in their roles. Similar story for Black Ops 3. The only one of our main four heroes who was really well developed was Richtofen. But again, as the season progressed, each character was built on until the ending of Revelations, where they all came together as completely changed people with new beliefs. Now, this is all assuming we even see these characters again. The cynical side of me is saying, these are all established actors, they won't be able to afford them for the whole season. But the hopeful part of me is thinking, well, Sledgehammer clearly has a massive budget for zombies. I mean, just look at their cutscenes. These can't be cheap. And there was this line that makes me think, okay, they're totally setting up for a season-long journey with these four. Or at least Marie. Now you can prepare yourself for a journey. I genuinely haven't been this anxious about whether or not a cast was coming back since After Origins. And with the characters done, that wraps up the overarching elements, which means it's finally time to get into the maps themselves. Starting with the prologue and Grosten House. I think I pronounced that right. A first for Call of Duty co-op modes, the prologue serves as a tutorial mode of sorts where players new and old can get accustomed to the mechanics of the game mode, including the cheap jump scares. Oh, well, we're doing this? Great! Once you arrive at the farmhouse, the rounds can progress and you can leave at any time, provided you have the 2500 points needed to escape. Here's where things get a little more interesting. See, the game will tell you that you have enough to escape, but there's nothing preventing you from surviving in the house for as long as you can. There's even special hidden challenges associated with the prologue for the really hardcore players that unlock special bonus characters for use in Grosten House and the Final Reich. One of these challenges is survive until wave 25 in the prologue. And, uh... I have no idea how you people do this. After escaping the farmhouse, the game will end as Marie heads toward Middleburg with hopes of regrouping with her team, leading us directly into the events of the Final Reich. But before we move on to the Final Reich, let's quickly go over the survival variant of the prologue, Grosten House. Grosten House serves as the game's secondary, non-objective oriented survival map in the lieu of Black Ops 2's Nuketown Zombies and Black Ops 3's The Giant. Except for the fact you don't have to buy a $60 season pass for this. Grosten House is literally just the farmhouse from the prologue. Except for in this variation, the farmhouse has a recharging Wonderfizz-esque machine, a mystery box, and a small little easter egg that pack-a-punches all weapons in the box. To do this, get a Jeff in the box, 
Jeff in the box. What the fuck ever. Throw it on this beam, save 10,000 points, give it to this piano, and voila, pack a punch weapons for all. The only problem I have with this map, besides its lack of content, is the inclusion of whistlings. With how small the map is, this was a terrible idea, especially spawning in multiple whistlings at once. They're fine in the final Reich, spoilers, but with the play space this cramped, their inclusion borderline ruins the experience. So overall, there's not much to talk about with Gruston House. I personally don't find it all that interesting, as I like some meat on the bones of my zombies experiences. But if you're in the mood for some old school, Nocturne Toten-esque zombies action, I'd recommend giving it a shot. And even I can't deny that when I'm not in the mood for an hour long commitment, Gruston House serves as a reasonably amusing diversion. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the final Reich. The Final Reich serves as the game's main on-disc experience and, as is the case since Black Ops 2, offers a ton of content for every type of player. Let's start, as we normally do, with the things the map does right. And spoilers, we're gonna be here a while. The map design. Easily the most important part of any map, trumping story, characters, easter eggs, or even the main features. And the Final Reich absolutely nails it in this category, giving us the most natural flowing zombies experience since Black Ops 3's Der Eisendrock. Like Der Eisendrock, and to a much lesser extent, Zombies in Spaceland and Shadows of Evil, the Final Reich features many different sized areas, ranging from tight close quarters to wide open areas to train zombies around. There's also tubes around the map that allow you to fast travel to the Pack-a-Punch area, which serves as the map's hub area and that it allows you to access every main area of the map with ease. The village, bunker, and docks all have paths that lead here, so if you want to save some time trekking around, just find your nearest pipe and head down to the pack area. While we're on the topic of Pack-a-Punch, the unlock method is, thankfully, quite simple. It uses the zombies gold standard of run around the entire map and activate a few things, found in Darice and zombies in Spaceland with their teleporters, Ascension's Lunar Landers, their Eisendrock's Pack-a-Punch assembly, and Revelations' Corruption Engines, just to name a few. I also really love the fact that you can buy ammo for any standard weapon after upgrading it. Much like Unlimited Sprint, I always thought that this kind of addition would just break the balance of zombies. But again, I was wrong. Cleverly, Sledgehammer have one balancing factor in place that prevents the system from being flat out broken. And that's that you can only purchase ammo for standard weapons, whereas special weapons like the Tesla guns can only be refilled with max ammo drops. This system helps make the game, well at least the first 30 rounds or so, feel more about personal skill and concentration rather than Oh well, I ran out of ammo, let's grab a wall weapon and expend clip after clip until I get an ammo drop. It's also just a ton of fun to use your personal favorite weapon. Let's say you get that full auto rocket launcher that I can't remember the name of, and you just want to go to town with Flak Jacket. Well, you can do that now. And you can do it for more than 5 seconds. Personally, I'd love to see this system adopted by the other studios, but something tells me that this game is the last time we'll see this edition. The environment and atmosphere. Jesus, goddamn Christ, the atmosphere of this map is wonderful. Due to the somewhat linear nature of the early game setup, the map is able to build up a sense of growing dread more effectively than something more free roamy like Transit, for example. It starts out normal enough, a quaint, snowy town, yet you can't quite shake the feeling that something's wrong you know, besides the undead. But as you progress through the map, things quickly take a turn for the worse, starting with the pest in the well. Unless you progress very slowly, this should be your first introduction to this enemy type, and it takes you by surprise more so than, oh, I guess it's time for a special zombie round. Oh, these are the special ones? Okay. Then you progress into the bunker, and the dread really starts to set in as you start encountering remnants of Dr. Straub's twisted works and the occasional scripted whistling breakout. It's all incredibly deliberate, yet it works very well. But the best part by far is the Tesla gun build process. You charge up the glorified soul box and then boom, all the lights go off in the facility and your only source of light is this low draw distance flashlight on your person. And to top it all off, just like the pests, if you do this process at just the right time, you'll get your first introduction to the Brenner, as he's scripted to sometimes spawn in as you're taking the pieces back to the workbench. Ah, Jesus! Who is this? Why is he yelling at us? The special weapons. Much like Zombies in Spaceland, this map has a ton of special weapons to play around with, starting with the Tesla gun and its accompanying upgrades. While the base Tesla gun may not be all that powerful, at least it's very easy to get. Simply lead the Geitzcraft device to three separate areas around the facility, and it'll be yours. This process is so simple, it can be done by round six, which just so happens to be one of the hidden challenges for the special characters. 
Best part is, there's no RNG involved in the build process like the Apothecon Servant on Shadows of Evil, the KT4 on Zetsubo no Shima, or the Zapper that needs green coins in Spaceland. And then there's the upgrade quests. The Final Reich takes a page out of Origins and Derizendrak's book in this aspect and features four main Wonder Weapon upgrade quests so that everyone in your party can have their own special weapon. And thankfully, the upgrade quests are fairly straightforward. Well, at least three of them are. Shooting the 84 glowing lamps for the Bloodthirst is pretty damn annoying. Moving on to the side weapons, we have the Red Talon and the Classic. Functionally speaking, the Red Talon is pretty much just an upgraded shovel, but this one's got occasionally appearing evil bullshit magic that'll protect you during executions. Which, uh, that execution by the way. This will never get old for me. And last but certainly not least, my personal favorite, the Classic. On first glance, it just looks like a normal PPSH with a drum mag, but this variant of the PPSH is actually an homage to the Ward at War iteration. It's even got a similar fire rate and ammo capacity, and it gets a silver camo when pack-a-punch just like it did in Ward at War. This thing is purely unadulterated fan service, but I can't deny the massive smile it put on my face. It really is the little things, you know? The enemy balance. This was the thing that scared me the most before release, because, uh, well, Sledgehammer doesn't exactly have a good track record when it comes to these. And neither does Infinity Ward. Or even Treyarch. But to my surprise, every special enemy in the game serves a specific purpose and has an effective counter. They're not perfect though, but we'll get into that later. There's the pests, which essentially serve as this map's hellhounds. Low health, fast moving enemies that make you take them into consideration when planning your next move. Then there's the unintentionally hilarious bombers, proximity activated mobile bombs. Time to go mobile. Their weakness is the little guy on their back constantly smacking his head on the bomb. All you have to do is shoot that and it'll die, disarming the bomber. However, this does send the bomber into a frenzy and it'll move faster than a standard zombie. So be sure to take it out quickly. And finally, there's the bigger enemies, the whistlings, and the biggest bat of them all, the Brenner. The Whistlings can spawn mid-round and will move incredibly slowly until enraged. These are the most controversial addition to the map by far, but personally, I think they're one of the easiest to deal with if you know how to beat them. The weak point is their spine, so in co-op, it's as simple as having one teammate enrage it and then laying into it as it targets them. But solo is where things get a bit more tricky. Because they can spawn in numbers exceeding five at a time, which is a bit ridiculous, they may seem overpowered and broken. But in actuality, there are quite a few incredibly easy ways to take them down. The first and safest is to take them to either the pilot light trap in the square, or the electric trap down in the labs. The second is to acquire the base Tesla gun, shoot them, and while they're stunned, lay into the spinal cord. One more tip I have, if there's one blocking a doorway, shoot it. This may sound counterintuitive as shooting at will enrage it, but during his charge up animation, he cannot hurt you. So again, with the proper timing, you can slip right past him as he's gearing up for a charge. With this tactic though, remember, do not stop moving until you hear this clunk sound. This sound means that the whistling has hit a wall or has just simply stopped. If you haven't heard it, it's safe to assume it's still charging. And just like that, I've become a tips and tricks channel. Great. As for the Brenner, he's just a big hulking motherfucker with it sounds weird when I say motherfucker, I never really realized that. Let's go with something a little bit more PG-13. As for the Brenner, he's just a big hulking dude with a flamethrower with no specific counter besides destroying his fuel tanks. Once that's done, his flamethrower will be disabled, he'll catch on fire, and eventually die on his own. But be warned, his health scales exponentially with every arrival. Luckily, he only spawns every couple rounds, so he's not too big an issue. And only one can spawn at a time on solo, unless you get really unlucky when you're trying to build the Tesla gun, as seen here. And now we move on to the final enemy, question mark, the treasure zombie. If you're familiar with the treasure drones from Exo Zombies, you probably know what a treasure zombie does. But for those unfamiliar, a treasure zombie will walk around the map dropping points, and if you can kill it before it explodes, then you'll get a free power-up. Only problems are, they're as rare as they are strong. Like, these things are bigger bullet sponges than a pre-patched brute. The casual quest. I really like when I can say this, as I don't feel I do it enough, but I like this map's quest. The casual one, not, not the hardcore one. Also, don't misinterpret that as this is the best zombies quest ever born. It's not overly simple like raves or an absolutely indefensible mess like Revelations, Garrod Crovy, and ah, uh, the doot doot titty thick. But instead, it plays out like a zombie quest greatest hits album. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a standard defense slash soul collecting step like in Moon. There's a step where you need to run around the map and activate things in a certain amount of time, like Derizendrak. Hidden things that can only be revealed with a special weapon like Zetsubo no Shima, an IGC prelude to the boss fight like Garrod Krovi, and a CGI outro that doesn't end the game like... No, wait, this is actually new. But talking about the main quest itself, I think it's a perfect time to get into the Panzer Mortar. <laughs> Thank you.
Now this is how you design a monster. From the carved out torsos that serve as its mouth, to the fact that Klaus is stuck inside it suspended by chains, this thing is horrific in every way, shape, and form, and I love it. Looking back, with this IGC in mind, it's kind of messed up that Klaus was right there in the prologue and Marie didn't even know it. Speaking of Marie, one last thing I'd like to mention before we get into the few things I take issue with. This shot in the outro. Five years later and I still can't write segues. Awesome. The reason I personally find this shot so striking is because we've never actually seen a character cry in COD Zombies before. Sure, we've heard some rando crying in Die Rise's radios, but this is the first time we've actually seen it. Even Black Ops 3, for all its talk of mortality and having to watch yourself check out, never fully went for it. It may not seem like much, but with the context of Marie and Klaus's contentious relationship, to see that shot of genuine anguish adds a human factor to the experience. But it doesn't end there. A first for Call of Duty Zombies, there's actually an extended ending if you do the hardcore version of the quest. Or as I like to call it, everything sucks for Marie Fisher, Director's Cut. Let's talk about that real quick. In the standard non-canon ending, she plays a part in the death of her brother, which is horrific enough on its own, but in the extended canon ending, she accidentally revives him with the hilt of Barbarossa's sword, which should be cause for celebration, but instead, Klaus berates her for her actions and starts stumbling away as Marie begs for him not to leave her. Then he starts screaming about how his blood is boiling, voices in the dark, and opening the gates of hell, and to top it all off, commit suicide via the pilot light in the square. God, even Black Ops 3 didn't cyberbully their characters this much. See, this is what I disliked most about the first two Black Ops Zombies games and Infinite Warfare. Keep in mind I'm speaking specifically about the Zombies portion of IW. That game's campaign was masterfully done when it came to characters. Villains, eh, not so much. While I had some fun with them and they were admittedly charming in their own way, there was no humanity to those experiences so they just kind of faded from my memory. Well, they tried to, but I don't think I'll ever forget how fucking terrible these two were. Despite loving much about this map, I'd be remiss in not mentioning the few things it does wrong. Don't worry, this will be quick. The jump scares. With the first couple of runs, they help strengthen the mood, but after a while they feel cheap and annoying. Especially when you're just trying to get a quest step done and zombies keep popping out at you left and right. Hell, on rare occasion, a zombie's collision can block a choke point and trip you up. A Brenner can spawn during the Panzer Mortar boss fight. There is absolutely no way for me to justify this. It's just fucking nonsense. Especially if you're doing the fight later on in your match and the Brenner has a shit zillion health. The bomber's proximity fuse. I can't get a beat on this thing. Sometimes you can stun it with gunfire and slip right on by untouched, but sometimes it'll just blow up and you'll take a hit. It feels a bit too RNG-ish for my liking. The Zeppelin step. On its own, I have no problem with this step. Damage the Zeppelin and charge up the battery it drops. Simple enough, right? But what I do have a problem with is the fact that you have to do this seven goddamn times throughout the quest. And as much as I don't really like it, it's not too big a deal as quests don't factor that much into my grading of a map, but I feel I wouldn't be doing my job properly if I just let this annoyance slip by. And finally, the Pack-a-Punch animation. Like the jump scares, it's cool the first couple of times, but after a couple of runs, it gets annoying. The animation itself is really long, and even when it looks like it's done, you'll actually have to wait another two seconds until the camo is applied, and then you can pick up your weapon. But until then, you're just sitting there like, Some BBQ, why can't I pick up Rockets Arbiter? Oh my god. I don't know, man, but the most important thing to remember is not to panic. Be cool, chief. Just be cool. Deep breaths. Dumbass. So, overall, the final rank is a surprisingly deep experience that offers tons of content while at the same time streamlining the experience for newer players and sets a very high bar. Not just for the non trek Zombies entries, but for Call of Duty Zombie mode in general. But perhaps even more surprising is that this map breaks tradition and proves that the other developers can do zombies properly. Which, for someone like myself who really didn't think they could, that's great. I don't care where the zombies comes from, if it's from Infinity Ward, Sledgehammer, Raven, Treyarch, as long as it's good, I'm happy. And in my opinion, this one is. So, overall, World War II Zombies is a fantastic, if slightly flawed rebound from the past two non-Treyarch Zombies entries that actually takes some risk by changing up the gameplay formula, while at the same time understanding what made the best Zombies entries work so well. The game controls well, the main map layout is great, the story is engaging, simple to follow, and actually makes you feel for two of the five main characters. I'm aware those aren't exactly fantastic numbers, but when you compare it to Black Ops 1, Black Ops 2, and Infinite Warfare Zombies, it's an effort I feel should be commended. Oh god, no, I'm feeling something! I need to... I need to go lay down. And finally, the prologue and the new notebook system makes the game more accessible to newcomers. That's a good thing, by the way. It's not dumbing down zombies for noobs.
you know exactly who you are. Although I have to say, I do have some worries about the future. The special enemy balance has the potential to get catastrophic like exozombies and the tragedy from beyond. And while I genuinely like her, I really hope the DLC season isn't just the Marie Fisher story with some other forgettable clowns thrown in. Give the other characters some love like Black Ops 3 did. Again, that's even if these characters come back in the first place, but regardless. If they can crush those worries while keeping what worked about the base game content, I feel we're going to be in for a genuinely fantastic season of zombies. Well, that's all for today. What do you think of World War II zombies so far? Do you like it? Dislike it? Or do you just find yourself saying, eh, it's zombies again, whatever. Tell me what you think down below. And please, for the love of God, keep it civil this time. We don't need a repeat of the Infinite Warfare comment section, do we? Anyway, thanks for watching, and have a great day.